Thanks a lot, Petra, for joining us today. It is an absolute pleasure for me to have my PhD supervisor as my guest today. Um, so we, we all, all know your exciting work from the waves of uh, min D, min E, but now you also reconciled it with the membrane, one of your passions. So we are really excited about your recent papers. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. You don't need much introduction for this audience, so I just leave the stage for you. Yeah, thank you very much, Edinch. Uh, it's really a, a pity that I cannot be uh, in person at the Karolinska because this is where I did my a part of my PhD. Um, the first couple of months of my PhD with Rudolf Riegler I was very close probably to where you are at the moment. Yeah, so I, I heard that there's a lot of membrane lovers around. So um, I decided to focus my talk on uh, the proteins that we like very much, the self-organizing proteins, but particularly what they do with membranes. And um, you probably would like to be reminded that um, what, what our ambition or long-term goal is um, to construct something like a minimal biological system. And this is because um, I'm a physicist by training and I believe in you know, um, minimizing systems in order to understand them. So as you might know, the real, the, the only big, you know, fully computable, fully understandable system in physics is the hydrogen atom. And everything that is com more complex than the hydrogen atom is actually too complex. And uh, it's pretty much the same with, this, with biology. I mean, biology is anyways too complex, but the question is, and that's probably a question that might a bit be, be a bit strange for a biologist, but not strange at all for a physicist or chemist is, is there a simple cell, a really simple cell, not a bacterium or uh, like microorganism with like only thousand genes, but something with very, very, very few genes, probably only a couple of them. I mean, not conceivable at the moment. So you will not find such an organism in nature anymore, but that does not necessarily mean that it has never occurred on earth because life has started somehow, somewhere under conditions we don't know exactly. But since that point, and that was probably 4 billion years ago, uh, it evolved. And um, as you all know, evolution means that things get more complex and uh, there's competition, uh, organisms are fighting for resources or ba basically even fight each other. Um, so complexity is very helpful in order to be a resilient organism. That's the reason why today on earth, after about 4 billion of years of evolution on earth, you can only find complex organisms. But that does not mean that, uh, you know, there might not be the possibility for a much simpler organism. And the question is now how simple is simple and how complex does it have to be if it still wants to live? And as I said, the, the, you know, the way back in time uh, from the complex organisms we find nowadays with their enormous number of uh, key components and interactions, um, taking basically the, the way back, like a Craig Venter or other minimal genome people are doing, will not take us to the minimal possible living system. They might be able to, you know, reduce complexity quite a bit, as you probably might know, Craig Venter has, uh, has accomplished a, a reduction by half, which is amazing. But that is not an, a minimal organism by no means. Um, and the about for, of the 500 genes which they are still in, about 150 are of unknown function. And that's, of course, not something that a physicist or chemist can tolerate. So our only way out is to try to construct from the bottom up this um, building blocks. And now the question is, what do we take as building blocks? And building blocks are obviously not atoms because that would take far too long. And uh, also we are not chemists, so we cannot build with atoms. Um, so what we are talking about as building blocks are functional modules because my uh, conviction is that um, what makes life is a combination of functions, of interactions between molecular players. And now we have to talk about molecules that do have functions and there are very few out there um, and all of them al almost all of them are proteins right everything that is in uh, you know that that you can actually assign with a, a real complex functionality out there in nature is a protein so what we do and that is of course a bit may come across a bit cheating we try to take proteins from organisms put them together and find out which ones are the important ones. 
Of course, I know very well that the proteins were not in the first cells, but maybe the functions that they stand for still today might have been functions that were there in very early representations of functional modules in early cells. And if this kind of philosophical, uh, it's the only philosophical part of my talk, uh, with this philosophical start, let's move into the uh, into the you know world of proteins and membranes because I think membranes are also very important for uh, the construction of a minimal cell. Now you might know that for about ten years uh, our group has been very successfully working with the so-called min proteins. So for those of you who have not heard of these proteins, um, they are the smallest is the smallest possible set of um, pattern forming. Um, molecules. If you if you want to uh, think of biological molecules, if you want to think of patterns as a very important ingredient of a living system, and in fact it is because a pattern means that the system is creating uh, you know uh, you know gradients. It's it's um, unmixing uh, systems and start to um, basically create an identity. So for that reason, pattern formation and self-organization, which is basically the, the, the reason for pattern formation is already, has already been considered for a very long time, a uh, key uh, constituent of living systems. And uh, Alan Turing, as you might know, has formulated a mathematical uh, condition of what kind of chemical reactions are actually able to form patterns. And miraculously, uh, it does not have to be very complicated. So all you have to have is a autocatalytic molecule, which basically makes more of its kind, and an inhibitor, which prevents it from making more of its kind. So in principle, you need two molecules, two kinds of molecules, which are basically uh, involved in reactions, which are very, very likely nonlinear, and which also take place on different scales. So one of the molecules, the activator molecule, is a, a very slow and local molecule, and the inhibitor is a very far range, ranging one. And if you talk about diffusion coefficients, it would always mean that an activator is a slow diffusing molecule and inhibitor is a fast diffusing. Which uh, have been described, the min oscillations, which have been described already uh, many, many decades ago by De Boer and, and many other people. Um, so, what happens here is that the bacterial um, systems, the bacterial cells, the E. coli bacterial cells, they basically grow only linearly in one direction and um, get longer and longer, and they position the divisome, which is basically the ring that contracts them to the middle because they do a symmetric cell division. And so they grow until they find they're long enough. That it's by washing away the components of the divisome by these mean proteins. So they basically uh, self-organize and they do that in uh, in the way that I will explain to you here. So the, the molecule that you see here labeled is an um, ATPase, mean D, it's a soluble ATPase, but upon ATP uh, binding, it goes to the membrane. So it's a membrane switch. It sticks to the membrane, it recruits more of its kind to the membrane. And if, if it's very highly um, accumulated on the membrane, it will recruit an inhibitor, which will help uh, getting rid of the ATP and basically dissociate the whole complex again from the membrane. So it's basically going to the membrane, accumulating there and dissociating or being dissociated by the, um, by the inhibitor. And um, so if you look at it, it's basically going, it's oscillating, it's cycling between solution and the membrane. And if you put it on a flat membrane that looks like the inner membrane of E. coli, it basically forms this very beautiful um, traveling waves. Um, this membrane is not a closed one, like in a bacterial system, it's an open, flat, infinite uh, membrane. So you basically don't see any oscillations. They basically just, um, uh, they distribute like waves. Now, what we, did, and uh, this was the work of Katja Ziske, by, by the way, the mints were introduced by Martin Lose to, to my group. Um, if you now want to lock them up in something that looks like a cellular system, um, it was very hard for a long time, and I guess the many membrane people in here know what I'm talking about, to make a vesicle and load them into a vesicle. That would have 
of course been the dream of us at that time, like 10 years ago. But it, it took quite some time until we accomplished that. So for the time being, we basically first a cut in, uh, you know, in little PDMS micro compartments, uh, shapes that looked like bacterial cells and clad them with membrane and let them open on the top. And if we did that, we could convert the, the, the waves into real oscillations because all what, what has changed now is that we have a limited volume. So the, the proteins are being locked up in a, in a system that looks like a bacterial cell, but contains only the proteins, the membrane and ATP. And what you can see here very nicely is how the waves, uh, the, how the oscillations scale um, with the size. And you could also see, and we didn't even expect that, that at, at the length to width ratio, where usually the cells divide, you can see that the oscillations divide into daughter oscillations. Of course, there's no division going on because this is a, you know, pre preformed compartment. It cannot, uh, you know, deform. Now, what we also see is that our min proteins, that was the proposal that they're basically washing away um, parts of this division ring. So if we put um, down in our mixture of proteins, uh, the filament, uh, the, the, the FDS set, which is the first protein to form division ring, you can very nicely see how the min waves are washing away um, the, the little FDS, so the min waves are green and the little FDS set molecules, which are supposed to form a ring if they are left alone. Um, here they are not, not left alone at all. So the min waves just wash them away. Now, if we fill it in a compartment where we have the oscillations, we see a very clear dip in concentration of the min waves over time. So it's a time averaged dip. And there you now have enough time for the, for the filaments to actually assemble in something like a proto ring. So you can very beautifully see this, you know, mutual um, positioning of the min proteins, which basically cover most of the time the pole regions and the, um, division region, I would call it, in the middle of the cell. And of course, that only works if the cell is long enough. Now, obviously, you can do a lot with these proteins. And the first what we, we did and what is very clearly uh, useful to, to try out is what happens if you mutate them. So there are two very distinctive features. And one of them might be a very important one also for the membrane lovers here. The distinctive features of these proteins are once, uh, of course, the ATPase uh, activity of the MinD. How how easily can it hydrolyze ATP, and uh, how can it be helped by the by the inhibitor? But even more interesting, probably to the membrane people, is the membrane binding affinity. That is a very decisive factor for this um, pattern formation to occur. Now, um, these proteins are not, uh, they, they basically bind uh, the membrane uh, by an amphipathic helix, which is not very strong. So um, in principle, they need to be dimers in order to bind the membrane in the first place. And um, what you can see very nicely is if this is the wild type uh, pattern, um, and this is the oscillation of, in, of the wild type proteins, if you just take out one amino acid from the, um, from the um, amphipathic helix here from the amine B, which is the inhibitor, you can see that the um, pole to pole oscillation is completely lost. And if you, uh, if you basically terminate the membrane binding affinity of, um, of the inhibitor, the MinD, the activator molecule, still binds the membrane. That is necessary. But the inhibitor doesn't have to. So it can basically uh, be completely soluble. But then um, you, still have, um, you still have patterns, and you still get some oscillations. But the oscillations would be completely you know, freaked up. Um, a cell with this kind of an oscillation would not be viable, obviously. But here you can see very clearly how important the membrane binding of these proteins are. Uh, is and um, because this question will probably come, the the particular type of lipids is not so important. But what is important is the charge of the membrane. So these proteins need negatively charged membranes. So the bacterial uh, membrane is uh, has a high um, uh, percentage of negative charges. So the, we, we, I can either use um, extracts, bacterial extract, or charged uh, negatively charged lipids, and then it works. And a little, uh, you know, a finding that just we, we just found out, and which I also find interesting, is we don't even need membrane. You, we have recently replaced it by polymers with negative charge, and you can also see almost the same uh, phenotype of oscillations there. 
Okay, what is also interesting because um, sometimes uh, if you want to have a patterns as a spatial cue for some processes, it's not so nice to have traveling uh, or dynamic patterns. It would be much nicer to have static patterns. And also that was what uh, Alan Turing was basically uh, talking about when he talked about morphogenesis, about Turing patterns are actually static patterns. And we found out that actually to convert our um, traveling waves into static standing waves or static patterns, um, you just have to do a couple of additions to the proteins, um, removing the linker from one terminus and putting it to the other one. So it's, it's not a, a big deal. Also uh, environmental factors could uh, basically change uh, the traveling waves into standing waves such as small bulk heights or um, also um, the uh, viscosity of the solution and the, the crowding of the solution. Now, now we are coming to the membrane, uh, you know, uh, the, the effects of these proteins on the membrane. For a long time, we did not observe any effects of that on membranes. Of course, we, um, we studied whether there would be a change in membrane uh, phase separation if you have, uh, you know, the, the proteins on them did not see much, but one, one of the biggest um, problems was that uh, we mostly looked at uh, standing uh, at, at, at uh, supported membranes on, you know, solid supports. But something that you can also see on a solid support and that surprised us in the first place was, uh, there were, I mean, there's basically two experiments in here. Um, one is a surprising one and, and one is not so surprising. So as I said, the main waves are um, they are basically um, peripheral membrane binders, right? So they have the antiparticulics, they bind the membrane and they can also dissociate again. So it is very likely that a strong membrane binder such as the min proteins would basically outcompete other potential membrane binders. So and this is what you see in these two movies here. So um, my student Beatrice Ram, she basically just put a M cherry molecule with a membrane targeting sequence in the soup together with the min proteins. And you could very beautiful now see how the min proteins produce the reciprocal pattern because they outcompete the binding of the M cherry. So by using M, the, the min proteins, and uh, as I showed you, you can also not only use the traveling ones, but also the standing ones, you can basically now create re re reciprocal patterns or reverse patterns of uh, peripheral membrane binding proteins, as long as they are not too strongly binding. If they are much, much stronger than the mins, then it wouldn't work. But the really surprising news was when Bea asked the question, what would actually happen if, I, if my protein in the membrane would not be able to dissociate? So she, she anchored the streptavitin with two membrane, uh, um, you know, two, two lipid anchors. And these proteins can diffuse, but they cannot dissociate. And look what happens if the min waves are now, uh, you know, introduced in this system. You can actually very beautifully see that these proteins are being pushed out of the way. They are being actively pushed out of the way so they, that you can create void zones. And this is a clearly directional and clearly active transport, what happens here. Um, which is, however, not specific at all. So you can, in principle, just wipe away anything that binds the membrane with the only condition that the molecule that you want to wipe away has to diffuse. So if you use, and of course, that's the first question for uh, membrane protein people, what if you use a big uh, ion channel or something that is statically really attached to the membrane, these guys, the min proteins will not be able to push around. But everything that basically peripherally binds and has a, a certain diffusional mobility will respond uh, in the way that you can see here uh, to the min oscillations or the min um, waves. And um, we basically uh, joined uh, forces with a theoretical group, which also models our, our, uh, our um, patterns here with the group of Erwin Frey in, uh, at the LMU of Munich. And we basically tried to find out what the physical reason of this phenomenon is. And it turned out that it is a diffusophoresis, a process that has been described in physical chemistry for several um, uh, you know, systems, however, not biological systems at all. And if you want to visualize how we assume that this happens, is that these min waves with their bulky proteins that are basically moving like a, you know, like a laola wave on this um, with a, with a 
basically crawling or, or almost like treadmilling on the on the on the membrane, adding something to the end and uh, to the front and dissociating what something on the end, you can basically see that the diffusion of other molecules will be biased, obviously, because this big bulky stuff is in their way. So, and by this diffusional uh, diffusophoresis, we have now also a mechanical. Um, role. It's not just, you know, um, excluded volume or so, it's really a mechanical sweeping effect. And this can be shown by varying the sizes of your diffusing molecules. We did that by engineering origami uh, DNA um, with different footages on the membrane. Um, this origami has two uh, membrane anchors, this one has 42. So this one would, of course, be a much greater barrier for the min proteins or also offer much greater resistance. And you can very beautifully see that the min proteins are able to sort these, right? These ones will be very efficiently pushed out of the way because they have such a big, um, you know, interface. These ones will not be as efficiently pushed. So if you, if you add your min oscillations or min pattern formation uh, system, you can very beautifully see these are the proteins. This is the uh, cargo with the two um, membrane anchors, and this is the cargo with the many mem membrane anchors. And you can see that this will be pushed most precisely, so with the highest um, uh, contrast. So it's a clear mechanical active transport, if you will, by these min proteins um, that are specific to the, um, to the uh, cargo but only specific to the size, not to the molecules. Okay, um, so what is our desire? Uh, coming back to the membrane question. So, I mean, if we want to construct a minimal living systems and if we are membrane lovers, obviously we consider a minimal system to be a membrane vesicle and the question that is, is out there and I guess everybody knows how easy it is to transform uh, like giant vesicles by physical forces of surface and line tension. Um, so the, 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 the question that I ask myself and that has been already around in my group for a long time is, what does it actually take to, you know, give um, very specific cues for the system, for the membrane system that it does something like that? So I, I guess everybody knows this, uh, this work. If you have uh, the phase separating uh, vesicles, uh, you always have um, uh, different viscosities of your phases. You have a line tension because of the different height of your lipids. Um, around uh, the domains. And if you play with the osmotic pressure, you can easily butt away um, the, uh, the domains uh, with the smaller uh, size by, you know, letting the line tension win over the surface, surface tension. And so the, 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 there was a very, um, I mean, it's, it's very, you know, obvious that in principle, all you would have to do in a system if you want to, to you know, control a spontaneous division, I mean, this is not controlled, of course, it's, I mean, you have the different domains and they will, of course, by the way, but it's not a, it's not a self division to the point that the system could be basically making a copy of itself. These are obviously uh, different daughters here. So the, the idea would be if, if you could uh, induce something like a kink to the membrane by some sort of a, you know, filamentous system or whatever, um, then in principle, you should be able to play the strength of the line tension and allow the system to arrest into a, you know, a div divided system. But how can you in induce a kink to the membrane? So in principle, you need something that induces a different curvature here. Now then let's look at the smallest, uh, you know, uh, system, this, you know, not smallest, but the most simple system that we've so far been working with. It's still not a simple organism, but it's simpler than a eukaryotic cell. Look at um, FTSZ in uh, E. coli. So um, as you might know, or this started too early, anyway, the, this disregard the, the movie at the, at the bottom, I'm, I'm coming to it. So um, as I told you, uh, what uh, the min oscillations in a bacterial cell like this are supposed to do is to position the little ring, um, which will then contract. So it's very likely that if we add our FDS set into the soup and uh, into our um, min soup, that if we really do it in a, you know, in a deformable vesicle, that this might induce some sort of a force that may allow us to divide the vesicle. Well, that's good thinking. It has not worked so far, but a lot of other things have worked and I would like to share them with you. 
So first of all, the problem is that the bacterium is a very small, uh, very small system. So the, the diameter of the native size of this bacterial, uh, you know, ring is about a micron diameter and all optics guys know, well, that's getting a bit hairy at that point. I mean, of course you can use super resolution microscopy, but then the dynamics is not so easy to follow. So um, ideally would like to have, uh, you know, vesicles in the size of like say 10 or five, but not much smaller than that. So if we, uh, this is to scale, so this would be about 20 micron in diameter. So if we decorate our purified uh, FGS set on, on, a, on a lipid vesicle, if we put a, a membrane anchor to it, um, then you can already appreciate that it is not, um, it's not a straight filament. It has uh, intrinsic curvature. Uh, it, it has many intrinsic curvatures. But as soon as you put it on a on a um, membrane that is flexible, that is soft, like uh, you know, osmotically deflated, you can uh, see that the the um, FDS set also causes indentations and deforms the membrane. So not uh, not dynamically, but statically. But it has a very interesting dynamics, and this was found by Martin Lose uh, when he was a postdoc in Harvard. That if you if you put your uh, purified FDS set on a flat membrane, it's not supposed to be on a flat membrane. It's supposed to be in a hollow tube. But if you put it on a flat membrane, you can actually see that it's it starts to um, do some very weird dynamics. So it's actually treadmilling in circles with little vortices. And the reason for that is that it basically has an intrinsic curvature. The filament has an intrinsic curvature. It also has a polarity. And what we also found out uh, by changing the membrane attachment uh, of the filament to the C or the N terminus, it's also, you know, it also has an, a, a direction for membrane attachment, which seems to be, you know, perpendicular both to the intrinsic curvature and to the, um, and to the polarity. And for that reason, you uh, basically create a chiral system. So your, your membrane attachment makes the system chiral. So if you put it on the C terminus, you can appreciate that it's treadmilling in the uh, uh, clockwise. And if you put it on the N terminus, you can see that it's treadmilling. It's not quite as nice, but you can see it here in, in this one, you see it very nicely. It's treadmilling the other way around. And that's because of the intrinsic chirality of this molecule. Interestingly, um, at GTP inactive, so the treadmilling is GTP driven, so it's a it's a um, it's a tubulin homologue what we have here. Interestingly, it is able to form uh, rings also without GTPase activity, but these rings are not uh, treadmilling, so they are just they basically condense into uh, in, into ring like structures, but they are not dynamic at all. And if we now look at what it does to the membrane, it, it's actually very interesting to see that the ones that are uh, treadling, treadmilling like this, they basically deform the membrane to the inside. So if you put it on a, on a flexible vesicle, you can see like here indentations from, uh, you know, from the outside. And this guy here on that uh, on that side of the membrane anchor on the other side, it will basically pull out the membrane. So the, the treadmilling um, has a clear directionality also in terms of force induced to membranes. And this can be even more beautifully seen if you, um, if you take a, a, um, a system that is not symmetry broken, where you basically, I mean, as you remember, there was a flat membrane that we offered. If we now put it on a cylindrical membrane, and that's we, we did first by creating little spikes that we coated with membrane. And um, if, we, if we put on, this is like microfabrication, if we put on, on, our, uh, on our FDS set on these little spikes, you can actually see that they treadmill in both, both directions that can be seen here on that side. So on hollow tubes or, or you know, um, spherical surfaces, the treadmilling is not, um, there's no symmetry breaking. It basically goes in both directions. Now, if we, if we put um, FDS set on our vesicles and pull out uh, a tube, a very soft tube from our vesicles with a trap bead, you can actually see how these uh, little um, dynamic rings how they basically enter the tube and start to treadmill in the tube. And as I told you, they will now no longer have a, 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 a preferent, preferred direction. They will basically rotate in both directions. And here you can see very beautifully that they deform the membrane like a spring. 
So they, they obviously um, induce uh, force to the membrane. It's very soft force, so it's only a piconewton or so that we could find. But it's really, uh, it's, it's really something that can be very clearly seen. Okay, now coming to the, to the, the holy grail, right? Uh, getting our min oscillations in, uh, in hollow and, and also deformable vesicles, because this is what we want to, where we want to end up. Um, at the end, we want to have the mins and the FDS set in there, um, but we're already there, but I'm not talking about that uh, today. Um, I'm talking about what the min oscillations do with these proteins, uh, with these vesicles. So first of all, the way of uh, introducing mean proteins into these vesicles um, is uh, the best way to do that is the CDIS method, which um, has been around for quite some time. Um, and Thomas Litchell is the student who has introduced it in our lab. Um, and he actually got it to work that all the mean proteins were filled now in, in our vesicles. Now we have one big problem, and this is the geometry. Uh, Vesicles are spherical, as you know, and um, E. coli cells are elongated and rod-like. So a pole-to-pole -pole oscillation, as you would expect it in, uh, in E. coli cells, cannot really be seen. However, what you see is all kinds of modes of oscillation. So um, here, um, some very seldomly you see indeed something like a pole-to-pole -pole oscillation, even if, if you have a round vesicle, very often you see, you know, things that go around uh, along the periphery. And in most cases, you see a volume to membrane oscillation so that all, mem all the proteins go in the lumen and then in the next instance, they all go to the membrane like this guy. And now the funny thing starts, if you now start to lower the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the um, uh, surface tension of these vesicles um, and, and make them floppy, then this oscillation between membrane and lumen leads to a bouncing um, up and down of these vesicles because, you know, you can imagine that the membrane is, uh, you know, stressed when all the proteins bind there and when all leave the membrane, it will be relaxed. And, and this gives you the, this uh, very beautiful representation of a bouncing vesicle. And if you go down and, and lower the membrane tension here even, even further by you know, lowering the osmotic strength, you can actually see that you even get something that looks like a, a almost a, a division and there is absolutely no um, structural protein in there. So this is all done by the mean proteins themselves. This is a, a, a side view, so you can very beautifully see how they almost, uh, you know, uh, separate from each other. They never made a complete separation. This is simply because the proteins that bind to the, uh, so the, the, the I mean, the only, the, the best that the proteins can do is to unbind. They cannot do more than unbind. So um, if you add proteins from the outside, like uh, Umi Dimovas group has uh, done recently, you can actually get the full fission. But as soon as, as long as you have your proteins inside, uh, it's relatively um, improbable to happen. Now, this is really cool. So it appears that you can use the min proteins really to not only uh, transport molecules on a membrane, but apparently you can also use them to exert forces to membranes. So you can really use them as a mechanical tool and um, my uh, postdoc, um, Mei Fang Fu, she carried that even further and now uh, designed a couple of membrane essays where she wanted to see how uh, the means can be harnessed to, uh, to do mechanical work. So what she did was to basically uh, form um, peptide crystals by D-phenylalanine, which are then coated with membrane and you can then dissolve the, the peptide and by this create hollow membrane tubes. Um, this is a bit more elegant and a bit easier than pulling the tubes uh, from, uh, you know, from, from vesicles, which is of course also very nice. But if you do that, you can get a, a lot of different um, membrane assays. So what, what she, for example, can get by adding the protein, um, the min proteins at a, you know, at a relatively early stage of crystal dissolution, you make basically little reservoirs of min proteins and they are able to, you know, hold the, um, the, 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 the membrane tubes together like a network. And if you now, 
induce the dynamics by ATP of these, then you can see that this whole network can basically uh, breathe. So, so you have filaments that are, you know, when the min proteins bind, they will basically extract and then they contract again. And um, you can really create almost like a, a, a very flexible uh, spring-like system. So if you look at the, um, at the length change of the different, uh, at the different, um, uh, tubes you can see that it's really almost a, a sinusoidal wave so it, it really follows like the the min binding and a dissociation like a spring would do so the the mins really do something like a, a spring oscillation and my fang also uh, came up with another uh, very beautiful uh, system where she um, uh, added uh, when she did not add the proteins but just dissolved the crystals like this she basically created membrane sheets that looked like, uh, you know, one membrane on top of the other, which were able to, you know, slide against each other. And in these systems, if, the, if she added the min proteins, you could actually, she could see that the membranes is really stretched out like, a, you know, you're, you're doing with the, uh, with the pizza dough, right? So you basically you take a, the, the noodle, or how you call it, the noodle, wood, I don't know what it's called in English, where you basically just, um, stretch out the membrane and make it flat and 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 you know um, change the, the the size of it. So this is a the time to um, area um, diagram, and you can very nicely see how how the mean waves basically stretch out uh, this this uh, membrane. And of course, this is also against. Um, a mechanical, uh, you know, uh, with, uh, you know. Uh, elastic force. So the min proteins have to act as a mechanical, you know, force inducer here upon uh, ATP hydrolysis, of course. And very, and this is a very, very fresh, uh, fresh piece of work. And I'm unfortunately lacking. I didn't get the, the movie in time. Um, so what you would see here, it would be a vesicle. So what you can see here are um, min patterns that are static, that are making, not, not that are not moving, but that are making like little labyrinth patterns. Um, and on these, you can actually see that if you have a membrane sheet on top of it, they will basically transport the membrane sheet along. and if that movie would run, you could actually see how a vesicle is walking along directionally. Just believe me, it's uh, <laughs> we are writing it up. It will hopefully also be published soon, but you could really see how a vesicle is, is walking directionally as it was pulled by a single directional motor uh, on this, uh, you know, um, min, uh, min, uh, min formed uh, patterns. So, it's really, it can be harnessed almost like a motor. And that's really cool, I find. Okay, so with this, I'm at the end and uh, would like to thank all my past and present uh, collaborators. That was a, a reunification in 2018. Erdinger, I'm sorry you were not in there. I, at that time you were not a PI, so I, I had to refine it to all the PIs, but the next meeting you will definitely be with us. And uh, yeah, I thank all my collaborators and uh, you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks so much, Petra, fantastic. And I'm also glad that I ensured my ticket for the next meeting now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I will just, uh, uh, could you maybe stop sharing your screen, Petra, so that um, yeah, okay. we can yeah. see the participants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I will, if you have any questions, please type in the chat. I will also allow, um people to unmute themselves if you have anything to ask you can also write in the chat and you can unmute yourself to ask your question so first i would like to ask one question petra that's still not very clear to me uh, as you said the last sentence was exactly the key for my question that they act as a motor yeah and of course it comes from the atp hydrolysis but overall physically i still cannot imagine that the um, how where this force that is exerted on the membrane that comes from by two simple proteins. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a elastic force. So it's basically changing the membrane properties. So it's uh, I mean, in, in, in principle, it is doing what a lot of other proteins are also doing. If you bind proteins to large uh, to large extent to to membranes, you will see that the membrane curvature is changing um, because, you know, they bind them from right one side and you and this will induce, uh, uh, you know, um, an imbalance of membrane uh, area. Um, and this basically results in a in a mechanical cue, and I think that's pretty much it. It's not much more than that. Um, the only difference is that it's not um, it's not uh, random, yeah. So it's not a random binding. It's not uh, it, it will not equilibrate as a normal. Um, uh, you know, if, if you have any membrane binding protein, you, you go down the, you know, the energy landscape and, and that's it, but it will not do that, but it will basically be forced by ATP to, to, to stay active. It will not equilibrate, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And by this, it's different from other proteins that are just inducing membrane curvature mm -hmm. by, you know, binding uh, as a curved protein, like the bar that proteins, sense, our, yeah. our favorite bar proteins. I mean, this is just a, uh, energetic, um, you have an energetic cost, or you you know it will be uh, an entropic um, uh, benefit, um, but it will be you know it will bind and that's it, right? Mm -hmm. But um, the, the the constant the constant replenishment and binding and 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 you know the the dynamics of it that that this is forced by ATP hydrolysis. Uh, makes a difference as compared to you know the simple curvature induced uh, protein bind. Thank you, Peter. So in in GUVs, basically, you have to see at some point this oscillation should, should stop when the whole ATP is depleted, right? It it, it will stop, uh, but it, it's actually remarkably uh, stable. So it, it it I mean, people have studied it over. I mean, I think Meifang has has done uh, for a day or two days. They've wow. studied the oscillation, so it's amazingly efficient in in over yes. ATP. Amazing. Okay. So next question is by uh, Mike Dustin. He's asking the defects in the SLBs, do they contribute to the patterns that you see? With the origami, with many anchors, are they diffusing or just movable? No, they're diffusing. They're diffusing. So if you if you look, I mean, it's only a, a small, I mean, we have only looked at small proteins uh, and uh, they were still, they were slow, but they were diffusive. Um, and yeah, I, what was the first question? SLB, that, defects in SLBs. Yeah, as a, uh, defects in SLBs are, you know, this is always where the patterns start forming. So if you have a, um, I mean, defects are always where it all starts. So if it, I didn't show that, but the, the mean oscillations, if you if you add everything to a, to a flat membrane, it will first bind to the, the, the mean D will bind to the membrane and then there will be hot spots where there's more of it. And, and there you start the, um, the oscillations. Thanks, Petra. So a related question is by Taras uh, Sitchin asking, what determines the period of oscillations for mean E, mean D, and period of spring from uh, FDSZ? Does it depend on some membrane properties? Um, yeah, yeah, it depends on all kinds of things. It depends first on the concentrations, on the ATP concentration. It depends on the, um, on the buffer solution. You can change it with crowding. So if you have crowding in your, in your solution, it will get smaller. Um, and of course, we have done all kinds of mutations where we change the, the pattern formation. With FDS set, um, the period of the, um, it's basically pretty much the same. It's all concentrations and uh, energy efficiency, which, which change the, um, the time scales. And uh, Peter, you showed one uh, experiment where you pull the tube from the GUVs and then see FDS set. Yeah. How does how does mean D and E behave in that setup? We haven't checked that. Um, we didn't do that with mean so far. Um, that's actually in, that's the next uh, you know iteration to 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 study FDS set uh, means and uh, and you know everything in one in it's one good. set. Mm -hmm. it's super good. Okay, so the next question is by Anand. Um, I wonder, does membrane pattern have something to do with the fingertip skin during the development? 
speculation on the basis of similar. I actually think that everything that is a pattern in higher organisms is uh, is going through transcription. So um, I don't think that any. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure, but I think every pattern that uh, you know are, are meaningful, biologically meaningful in an organism, in a multicellular organism, are basically transcribed. So I don't think that they can be you know uh, tracked down to proteins only it is always it always has to do with the number of proteins in a cell so the, the whole cell is then you know different from its neighbor cell um, and that would not be the case here i mean here you just have the proteins thanks petra so next question in the beating vesicles, why is there such an inhomogeneity in the beating pattern? Can it be made more homogeneous, like all vesicles doing the same thing, like palpitating uh, cells? Uh, that is a that's a cool question. That'd be super Synchronized. cool to do that. I mean, as I said, the, the, it depends strongly on uh, the concentration. And the first thing is that you cannot be sure that you deliver the same number of proteins in every vesicle. Um, so if you if you if you could really I mean if you would if you would make it microfluidically we have not uh, accomplished that so far if you could be sure that all the, the the vesicles are the same size and they all have the same protein inside um, that we cannot do yet this is technically not yet possible I mean it's it's in principle possible but we have not accomplished it um, mm -hmm. then you would see very very likely the same period. But still, you would not see the they all in 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 sync, right? So that that <laughs> I mean, this is a random. I mean, maybe you could do it by you know light activating yeah. or something like that. Uh, but that I, I'm afraid that is uh, it, it would not probably not be worth it, right? So I mean, unless we can find out that you can do something with it, then then it might be useful. It's cool, but it would be cool, yeah. Okay, so next question is by Edge Erol. Um, is there an increase in the membrane adhesion time as the concentration of mean proteins increases? Ah, in the adhesion time. Mm. Now we have not measured the adhesion time. That is uh, not, not an easy parameter to measure, but I would definitely think that it's actually getting faster. So it's a it's an autocatalytic process. So when um, I would say that the next and the next and the next day, basically um, they even come close, came faster if um, if one is already sitting there. And same true in the other side. In the other in the dissociation, we actually saw that that if 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 you have a I mean the, if, if you look with AFM on the on a on a min pattern on a membrane, you can see it's very very densely packed. It's almost like a two dimensional crystal on the membrane. And if then uh, the min E comes and starts the, the you know the hydrolysis so that everything falls apart, you can really see large chunks of um, it's almost like a catastrophic event um, in the in the microtubules, just in a two dimensional uh, representation. So I think it's it's actually you know uh, it's it's auto catalytic. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question, Petra. Um, sorry, I'm bombarding you with questions. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, in, in the vesicles that are oscillating, what happens when you put FTSZ? I think um, the GUV system when you had the MinDE system. So, I, I, I unfortunately I don't have the the movies here. So, um, what you see very beautifully is that the, in the in the um, in the vesicles with the FTSZ. So we have FTSZ. Actually, it almost looks like a, a ring around, and you can really see how the vesicle, how the oscillations basically position uh, the FTS set in the middle. So same thing as uh, as you saw it in this uh, in this chambers where the the, the FTS set rings are positioned by the means. This is something you can beautifully see in, in the vesicles. However, um, what we have not yet accomplished is to have a a, a, a protein uh, a system where you let me let me show you this here um, uh, because it's really cool. Um, well, because you can see the mince and the here we go. I share my screen once more. Is it yes, okay? yes, sure. Go ahead. So. This is also my Fang Fu's work. 
So here I, I don't have to. Here you can see something really cool. So these are these are um, these vesicles that my fang sees. Um, this they are not flat here; they are relatively bulky, and the green little things are FTS sets. And here you can see that it almost I I, I, I like to compare it with the Jeff Koons balloons, right? Where you basically hold, so it does not look like the FTS set is is, is really uh, twisting very well, but what you can very nicely see is that it holds. So the the mints blow up and the FTS set holds, and by this also creates um, you know um, zones where you would have a great uh, mechanical force to be uh, exerted by this. So far, I, we have what we have not yet accomplished is that we have like a, a flat vesicle with a ring in the middle and, you know, a real, you know, pinching off that we have not yet seen, but we are kind of close to it. So it, I, I, for a long time, I thought it would not be possible at all, but I think it's, it's actually doable. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. So another, another question is by Christina Pollard. When the you said there is charged dependent binding. Um, mm -hmm. The oscillations, would they change the membrane polarization? Um, I mean, the membrane polarization, we have not tried that. Um, would also not be so easy to test that, but I mean, it could, it could, it could be. I mean, it could be that the mem, it could be, so if we had a, a voltage sensitive probe, that's actually a really good idea. We could try to put a voltage sensitive probe in the, in the membrane or at the membrane and then see how it responds to the min wave. That is possibly, you see something. And similarly, the packing, the packing density of membranes probably I don't remember from old papers if any of the new new papers showed this if the packing density would change with the waves. Uh, I kind of recall that there is a paper. Um, there's a I, I think a Taiwanese group who reported a similar, very similar effect that we saw it with the sweeping, and I think they also looked at the membrane and claimed that there would be a different packing density, but I'm not entirely sure how I, we haven't done that. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I, I don't, I don't want to sell other people's data. I haven't checked it, at, but it's, it's not unlikely. All right, Petra, one, one last question by me. Um, you initially started with this very ambitious goal that we are going to make a minimal cell. Yeah. How, how far are we, do you think? Uh, I, I think we are not so far from minimal division. I mean, and that's only a part of it, of course, right? So, I mean, the minimal division, I think, will happen. That, that we will get. Um, this I, I, maybe fewer proteins than we than we thought. Um, mm -hmm. Then the next step is, uh, of course, obviously, um, some sort of a chromosome, some sort of an information molecule. We haven't done at all anything with that. Um, I'm, I'm pretty sure it will have to do something with, you know, all the liquid liquid phase separation. Uh, you will have to deal with it for sure because the chromosome is not only, you know, um, it's not only DNA with information, it's also a, a charged polymer. Uh, and then the big, big, big problem is the metabolism. How do we replenish it all, right? Uh, I mean, that after one division, the thing is not just dead because it's, so that is, a, that is a challenge in chemistry. And so far the chemistry, uh, I mean, the chemists have not been too obsessed with this kind of approach. So I, 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 most people are physicists doing that, some biologists, some physical chemists, but no real organic, you know, hardcore chemists. They have better things to do. <laughs> <laughs> but if they discover that as, a, as, a, as, a, as an interesting field, I, I'm pretty optimistic. And uh, so for the young generation, where do you think the bottleneck is so that people might focus there and eventually maybe they contribute to the you know, first real synthetic replicating cell? Ah, oh, I, I think at some point we will come to a, you know, to a, a 
kind of a philosophical bottleneck because we I think it's not very clearly defined what we what a living system really is so I mean you, of course you can now what you can do is to to, to mimic features of living systems and that's what we're doing right we, we mimic division self-division which is I mean self-organization is already cool pattern formation is cool self-division would be even cooler but you would still not you know, uh, even if that thing would st sit there and divide, uh, you would still not take it as a living system, obviously, right? So I, I think it's uh, at some point we have to ask ourselves what is actually a living system. So what 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 do we ask for? But there are so many technical challenges. I I think there's lots of lots of work for the next generation. The the the, the Cree, the key problem will be to get financed, right? <laughs> so you have to, at some point, you have to show that it's relevant for, you know, society to have these, other than just being cool, cool, uh, you know, systems to work with. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I hope uh, we'll come to that point that uh, people will understand synthetic biology might. Um, yeah, might I mean, I, there, there will be, there will be, uh, you know, there will be a lot of spin-offs, uh, spin-off insights. Who knows what you can use it for, right? So, I mean, for sure, what would be cool is if you if you could you know if you could put photosynthesis in there, right? Some 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 you know uh, energy mm -hmm. efficient photosynthesis. So that might even be relevant for you know pot potential applications. Yeah, exactly, I think this is probably a good good challenge, yeah. good take home message as well. So thanks a lot, Petra. That was fantastic. It was really good to see you. Many, too. many interesting questions. Yeah. So I hope to see you uh, in person. Absolutely. In Stockholm soon. Let's hope. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Take care, Let's Petra. Thanks for joining us today. Mm -hmm.